we are now having our seventh hearing into the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus epidemic uh, situation around the world. Uh, so what I'd like to do is turn it over to our Chief Justice, Sir John Walsh of Brana, to uh, open the proceedings. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Thomas. I formally open this seating of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Weaponization of the Biosphere. This is the number seven uh, episode in this particular part of the inquiry. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, with me uh, on the bench uh, Erna McGurk, the new Associate Justice of the International Tribunal for Natural Justice. She was sworn in less than two weeks ago, and this is her first formal seating. The official duty I've given her is, if my internet fails during the evening and I go blank, she is to take over and continue until I uh, manage to, uh, to reconnect. I actually should say that this should be uh, a seating of the Irish court because apart from Nancy having Irish ancestors, uh, we have an Irish justice, we have uh, an Irish uh, prime witness, and uh, although most people just see me as peculiarly English, I am also Irish uh, with an 800-year heritage and I carry an Irish passport, so I'm a genuine Irish person. So welcome everybody and uh, uh, I understand Amani uh, is, is having this recorded and Thomas you're going to introduce the speakers I understand. Yes I will. So yes I'll introduce everybody. Um, first off I'll just uh, introduce Imani Mamalushan and Chris Fern who are basically uh, running the support for this and our trustee, Dr. Nancy Ash, and uh, Sandra Michael, who's one of our commissioners. But as for our guests and um, for giving testimony tonight, I'm very honored to have here Dr. Dolores Cahill, who is basically uh, a molecular biologist and immunologist. And um, if we actually read her list of credentials, we wouldn't have time for a discussion. Just uh, very um, well-educated and experienced in this field. So we look forward to that. And um, also Dr. Mikhail Nordfors, um, who is a medical, Nordfors, sorry, um, a medical doctor, a musician and, and a political reformer. So it should be very interesting. So I think overall, you know, as we've been looking at this situation over the last couple of months and having these hearings, we've seen quite a sort of progression of events, you know, more and more people speaking out, questioning, you know, the very science you know, what's actually happening with this? Where is the, where are the governments going with it? Um, so I think, and of course now we see in the States, it's turned into um, you know, large protests and riots. People seem to have forgotten about staying inside. Um, so it's an ever-changing situation, but at the core of it, we still need to really understand what the science is behind this so-called virus and pandemic, because it's, I believe it's very critical to the future of humanity. If you know, we can't travel without getting some sort of um, monkeyed up virus into our systems, you know, we're a bit worried. So, so, so Dr. Cahill, no, thank you for being on. Um, I suppose probably the first question, I'd just let you perhaps just give a little introduction to yourself and uh, just maybe in, in brief, give us your overall impression of what the situation is and where you think it's going. Yeah, so my background is molecular biology and immunology, and I spent my career basically profiling serum and plasma from people with autoimmune diseases and later on with cancer. And I was involved in setting up companies and another application of the technology I invented, uh, high content protein arrays, was to look at the specificity and cross reactivity of antibodies, which were used as research tools and in diagnostics. And sometimes the antibodies that were published were not exactly binding proteins or whatever that they were sold as. So that means I've been involved in looking at research integrity and validation science. And I put all of my proteins and arrays in a repository so that the science community could check if my results were okay. And I think that's one of the learnings in this area is that just because people, for example, say they have a test against the coronavirus, whether it's a PCR test or an antibody test, 
we really have to check what are they amplifying up and what those antibodies are actually against. So that would be my background. And I suppose why I decided to speak up a number of weeks ago now was when the Irish Medicines Organization came out with the press release that they would mandatorily vaccinate the total population of Ireland with an influenza vaccine. And there would not be that many people aware of issues around, we'll say, if you have coronavirus in an influenza vaccine, that when people naturally come across a coronavirus again in a number of months or years afterwards, that there are publications now that those people can have serious adverse events um, like sudden shock syndrome or a cytokine storm and potentially die. So that I wanted to raise issues about, you know, the solution to the current COVID-19 issue has been waiting for a vaccine or to vaccinate people with influenza uh, vaccine. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of discussion concerning um, you know, the exosome virions, you know, with uh, actually a number of doctors coming out saying that, you know, viruses aren't even, um, you know, pathogenic vectors in that sense. Um, I believe that there's a wide range of ideas on this. I've tried to read a little bit on it, not a scientist, but I try to understand. What, what is your take? Is there actually a pathogenic virus? And, and, do these tests actually test for that specific virus? Has it been basically brought to you know, the so-called gold standard or whatever they say? So I have been reading for many years, like Professor Stefan Lanke took a court case in Germany around yep. for people to actually identify the measles virus. And I think there were over 3000 publications and he actually won in the Supreme Court in Germany that people had not properly identified the measles virus. So this is a complex issue, but I, obviously I do think viruses exist and I do think that this is a virus and coronaviruses cause 40% of the time, every year when we have influenza-like symptoms, 40% of the time it is coronavirus um, and the common cold is a coronavirus. But I think what's not getting through is that there is no vaccine against coronaviruses. So SARS and MERS were coronaviruses and they've been around about 17 years. And there has been a lot of effort to try and get a vaccine against, we'll say, the SARS virus and these coronatype viruses. But the reason why they are not available to people is when they do the animal studies, that the animals are fine generally after the vaccine. But when they come across a coronavirus naturally within, you know, some time, months or years later, that the animals get very sick and they either are very ill and die, and when they open them up, they find that they have this inflammatory response in their internal organs and tissues. So that's why I think it's important for people who have a background in immunology to try and tell people that there may never be a vaccine for this coronavirus. And so to try and put the life of the people on earth on hold to wait for a vaccine for this coronavirus, it may never come. So we need to look at other solutions. And, and I've also been talking about issues of prevention, you know, that you actually, if you eat well, you have very little stress and you make sure that you have vitamins and we'll say zinc that you can protect yourself and that there are drugs that have been well known to provide prevention and treatment so that really there's no need for the world to lock down at all. And also if we have preventions and treatments, there's no need for masks, no need for social distancing and no need for the poverty that's going to be associated with people not able to earn a living so that they won't make money and that in months and years to come, they actually will be malnourished potentially or due to poverty, uh, the health systems will be run down and their health will be run down. So that we need to you know, now inform people of the symptoms, prevention and treatment and literally unlock the world and children have been deprived of an education and 20 year olds are not going to university. There's also no need to change how the schools and restaurants and hotels function. So generally I would be trying to say to people, we can take prevention and treatment and to unlock the world and go back to the old normal. Right, so you believe that the whole, whole lockdown was basically- It's not about belief as well. There is actually no data, you know, there is no hard data. So what I've been doing for the last few weeks is just identifying papers that show that the lockdown is not necessary. There's no real data behind social distancing and the masks are actually harmful for the people who are wearing them because they reduce their oxygen and they depress right. their 
system. So I've been asking the governments and the politicians not to answer to me, but to provide the data for why they chose this lockdown. Because in history, for hundreds of years, we never quarantine healthy people. We quarantine people who are sick. And I think an inquiry, and I've been calling for an inquiry, is that in many countries in the world, they've actually put people who are sick into care homes. Instead of actually, it was very well known early on that the people who were the most badly affected often had poor immune systems. And instead of boosting their immune system and preventing them getting symptoms, that wasn't done. And But people who had the coronavirus were put into the care homes so that they actually had a higher chance of getting the virus and been infected and been sick. So partly why we, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak is that we need to actually come out about this now while it's on to real, for the population can then realize that how this has been handled is entirely incorrect and that mistakes are being made every day and we need to learn lessons, you know, so that we, we are saying it now and in the months and years to come, that will echo so that we don't do this again. Right, no, thank you for that. And maybe one more question and we can move on a little bit is, um, because you're talking about there's never been a successful uh, coronavirus vaccine. And of course, now we know they're racing to put some through. I was reading some uh, on so-called electroporation to get these like RNA vaccines to be accepted into the system. Um, what's your take on that? Does, isn't that going to cause some kind of like uh, down chain genetic disruption in people's progeny? I mean, it, you know, if they want to vaccinate the world with some sort of genetically modified organism, you know, what do you think of that? What, what's your knowledge? You know, am I asking the right question on this? Uh, I have a feeling that there's something wrong with what they're doing there. Yeah, so I definitely, I have said publicly that I would not take such a vaccine and I would, you know, echo that there, it is potentially very dangerous and that the virus can integrate into DNA and potentially go down through the generations. And this is essentially an experiment with people that would have potentially multi-generational consequences in addition to the issues around the immune system that having coronaviruses in the immune system seems to set it up, predispose the immune system for when it naturally comes across a coronavirus again, that you have an overreaction of the immune system, which leads to a cytokine storm, which leads to, you know, a, 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 an inappropriate overstimulation of the immune system that can look like shock symptoms or can lead to a collapse and can lead to death. So there are multiple issues going on, but I think what we need to do is there are like preventions and treatments there. So things like low dose type one interferon and uh, low dose hydroxychloroquine and zinc, which means that people, you know, no matter how immunosuppressed they are or elderly, that they can actually be prevented from getting the symptoms and prevented from the worst consequences and death. And that, that uh, hydroxychloroquine works within three hours in the preventative dose and has a half-life of three weeks. And it has been shown to be, you know, it was an essential medicine uh, on, of the World Health Organization in, one of, in its reports. So it has been shown to be safe. And if it does have issues around heart arrhythmia, they can be checked before that and then another prevention and treatment given. So really there is no need for the vaccine and there's also no need for tracking and tracing people. And because we have preventions and treatments, there is no need for the societal consequences that they're having. So I, would, I have also said that if they try and bring in a mandatory vaccination or a vaccination to fly or to return to work, that I would happily take a case and I would not take the vaccine myself. Um, and it should not be happening. And I suppose it, then we go into things like our rights, you know, for freedom of speech, not to be censored in these discussions and social media. A lot of, we'll say in Ireland, we have RTE and in the UK, they have the BBC. They're also not interviewing a lot of the more eminent people who have other, you know, aspects of this so that the public are not getting um, a good representation of the um, way they may potentially be being exposed to illness, you know, that if there is a prevention and treatment and you don't need to make these societal changes, there should be open debates and discussions. And also we have unalienable rights, including, you know, freedom to travel, freedom to work and provide for our children, freedom to assemble and associate. And we also have bodily integrity and we have, should have 
full informed consent. So this issue around the coronavirus, how it's been handled, how the media are interacting, how the politicians are not really questioning the medical establishment and the science advisors, and how the, um, there's not an open debate, it's raising many issues. But I think what we have to do as scientists is continue to speak up so that when people realize that they're not been well served by their political and medical establishments, um, that they will know that we have been trying to speak out and that there will be a catalog of videos like this that they can go back and look at and see, you know, that when there's devastation in business communities, that this is all unnecessary. You know, we don't need the lockdown and we could actually end it very quickly and safely. All right. Oh, thank you for that. Um, very common sense, but also very well thought out um, from a professional perspective. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, I'd like to, uh, Dr. Mikhail Nordflores, thank you for being on here. Um, look forward to hear what your views, uh, you're a medical doctor. Um, are you yes, actually uh, are you treating any patients? Have you dealt with the coronavirus firsthand? Yeah, yeah I, I had a few treatments, mainly from friends and acquaintances because officially I'm not treating corona infections, but actually my wife had uh, antibodies against corona and was sick for two weeks. And uh, I was sleeping beside her and was very close to her and I didn't get any symptoms because I took all the right things. And, uh, and I also tried, uh, there are some more treatments. It's so easy with Dolores because I became something like a YouTube star in Sweden recently. So I'm the only doctor speaking up against the establishment. And my videos were shown like 170,000 times in Sweden, which is a small country. That's like 10 million views in the US if you compare it. Mm. And uh, of course, because of this, uh, they were taken away from by YouTube <laughs> because I was speaking out. One of the titles of the videos was uh, the COVID-19, the most expensive vaccination uh, marketing program in history. Mm. So I said uh, that uh, uh, I have been very harassed by the uh, government. Uh, I started with me being able to heal back pain by, by uh, manipulating some ligaments and muscles in the deep pelvis, pelvic region. And uh, I had some court case, I could heal all back pain 90% in half an hour. And I thought that everybody would, everybody would get very happy because of this. But no, no, they, they, they started to uh, you know, harassing me and trying to take my license. And I had the court case, which I won big time because I found lots of references supporting my case. And then they started to harass me in media, calling me the anal doctor, because sometimes I, I used to, you know, it's near the, this region I was manipulating people. And then my career was destroyed. And that was also funny because then I had to go to alternative medicine. It's like destiny showed me this way because it was the only work I could, could get. My choice was become an alternative doctor or a social welfare case. So uh, that's a long story. <laughs> but in the anyway, I, I learned quite a lot about alternative medicine, working mainly with cancer and borreliosis or Lyme disease. And uh, I found out it's the same treatment that you can treat everything with the same treatment, basically. So I called my, my practice now the mitochondria gym. Uh, you see, if you get the mitochondria, that's the life end of your key. If you make them function, you heal everything from cancer to borreliosis to COVID-19, whatever. And uh, so I used also some other treatments. And my favorite, the best treatment I know of for uh, COVID-19, and it seems like that in Italy and Spain from early research, and I used a better method than the Italians and Spaniards. It is uh, ozone treatment. It is perfect for COVID-19. It kills viruses. And it, uh, one of my friends treated Ebola, uh, uh, Robert Rowan from California, and his friend Howard Robbins from New York. And they had 100% success rate in Sierra Leone some years ago <coughs> in the Ebola epidemic. And uh, thanks, after treating five patients all successfully, they were thrown out of the country because they couldn't, uh, they could risk the, you know, medications. They wanted to sell expensive medications and the vaccines. Uh, and uh, so I use a similar treatment for COVID-19 and it is very successful every time and no side effects. And another very good treatment is vitamin C infusions also that they have been using in Shanghai, in China with success. And also hydrogen inhalation is fantastic. If you inhale, inhale a mixture of hydrogen 
I did that to my wife and to other my friends who had COVID, and my daughter was had COVID, and it was very successful. And there was that in China. So what I do is not very spectacular. I actually check out what do people do in other countries that don't have such a big problem, and then you find out, and then you do it. Like there's no no COVID nineteen in Africa almost because in malaria countries they take malaria prophylaxis and they don't get COVID nineteen. In India, they have official recommendations that all uh, relatives to COVID-19 patients and all uh, care personnel and policemen, they take malaria prophylaxis, if hydroxychloroquine, and they have almost no deaths. Now it's very funny because I, I understand that in media, uh, hydroxychloroquine has been so demonized. Suddenly it's the worst, most dangerous medicine in history, and they, I don't know how could it be approved if it's, this is true. And you see so clearly how all, he, this whole campaign is just about selling vaccine. And these psychopaths are willing to, to, to sacrifice hundreds of thousands of lives and the whole economy just because they want to sell a stupid vaccine or some expensive medicines. And if there is remdesivir on the media, it's fantastic. And there's no effect, no efficacy. They, they, they took down the, the mortality rate. There was no, no advantage in mortality in the study put by Bishon Lawson, and then removed this from the study. I mean, they are, and, but the most funny thing is that I understood if hydroxychloroquine shows to work, they will end up with the pants down. You know, it's so embarrassing for this establishment, so embarrassing from mainstream media, so embarrassing for the uh, medical authorities. In my country, they, they took away hydroxychloroquine. We're not allowed to prescribe it as general practitioners, only rheumatologists and, and in you know, clinical studies in hospitals. And I think I was strongly protesting against this and I made, made a video when I made a prescription and published it. And I wanted all my colleagues to do that, but nobody died to do it. I'm the only one. What I mean is that then they found out this fake study published in Lancet on 85,000 patients and such. And now it was just, and that, that study, I said directly, this is fake. I stated this publicly. This is like the wet dream for the pharma industry just study. Uh, by the way, hydroxychloroquine didn't work, and it increased the mortality. And they also found out, it was many people stated that uh, lipid-lowering medicines would be a risk factor for COVID-19. But in the contrary, in this study, lipid-lowering medicines and ACE inhibitors were good. And this is not possible. I thought this is crazy. And now they found out uh, part of the study was invented by a science fiction writer and uh, uh, adult model. Uh, <laughs> and the, the company who made the study had six employees. And how can six employees co co take down data from 85,000 patients in a couple of weeks? And they found out that the hospital stated that part of the study never had heard about this company. So it's complete fakery. And if people don't understand now that they are lying, I made a Facebook group with very high, many people coming in direct, and it, the title is Stand Up, They Are Lying. And I want everybody to go down on town with a little badge, Stand Up, They Are Lying, They Are Lying. We must inform people that we are betrayed, and the whole medical system is not there for us. And it's funny, funny, I met a friend who had a meeting with one of the directors of the hospitals in Sweden, and in that meeting, he said directly, we cannot cure people because we then we destroy the market. And now he, he recorded this. And now he has this as like, if they make a problem with his clinic, you know, he can publish this. Right, right. So you're saying, well... It is really so. It is absolutely so that we as doctors, we are not allowed to cure people. They right. don't want us to do this. And that's why, that's why I became a doctor. And we have to change this. And they want to take control over the whole world. And the establishment has one tactics. They always use. They sabotage. They are afraid of something. They try to take it over. When they had socialists, they were afraid of 100 years ago. They sponsored Lenin and Stalin and all these guys to make a mad reinversion of socialism in the Soviet. So that we could say in the West that they are dangerous to communists. And, and they robbed the Soviet Union and sent the banks in the West sponsored Lenin. And I never understand why. Because right. he robbed Russia and sent the money back five times to the banks. And then socialism was demonized and they could use this to stop it. And the same with the, now the environmental movement. 
it's only about climate, so they forgot everything about uh, uh, the glyphosate and mercury and 5G. And it's the same now about the world government. Because I made a chapter, I just released, released a new book in Swedish, and I released it in English recently. It's called Democracy, the Solution to the Political Dilemma, How to End Slavery, basically. But I consider us all to be slaves, and we have to raise up and stop slavery. That's what I really want to do. That's my mission in life. There's only one way to stop the world government, and that is to make a world government. <laughs> <laughs> right, but we have to make it democratic. So I have, a, I have a plan how to make a democratic world government. And I invented something called liquid democracy, or I call it democracy. It means that you can have votes in all issues on the internet. And you can govern a country by these internet votes. But nobody can understand all the issues and have time to understand everything. And then you can delegate your vote to a specialist. For example, in medicine, I would gladly delegate to Dolores. That was very funny because I made these videos and then I found a woman telling exactly the same thing as I said. Way, I'm not alone. <laughs> you're you're right. telling exactly the same things as I said in my video. It's so funny. So we are on wavelengths, I think. <laughs> I hope no, to meet you when I come to Ireland. So l let me ask you, so now I pretty much get what you're saying there and your experience. So you're, and you're saying they're lying. So if, if, if you had to name like three or four people, three or four organizations, who were basically behind this, um, which could potentially cause you know, a lot of death, you know, not just hundreds of thousands, but potentially millions on reactions of global vaccinations. Who would you name if you had to name somebody from your professional position? Well, I mean, what the names I know is, for example, Tony Fauci, it's quite obvious that he is very heavily, and he's obviously sponsored the construction of this virus, this $7.4 million or something. And Bill Gates is cooperating with Fauci, very obviously. I mean, this is very well-known facts. And the whole CDC seems to be corrupted, and the pharmaceutical industry, and the, the guys behind the pharmaceutical industry, the bankers, etc., etc. And they are so afraid. I was invited. I became almost a member of Illuminati once. So I was invited. I was sitting with these guys in Washington meetings. And then I found out, I, I, for example, I knew the, the, the democracy advisor of, of Obama, uh, Beth Novak, and, and I understood how to become a democracy advisor of Obama. Well, you should make democracy look nice. Just remember one thing, Rockefeller and Rothschild should decide. <laughs> right, right, no, real yeah, You should have a nice looking democracy, but no democracy. Democracy is strictly forbidden. So oh, no. In my world government, I would have one chamber that is electric, like, you know, uh, e-voting with the liquid democracy. And then I would like to have, according to Athenian system, one chamber where people are assigned by lottery. Not ambitious people, rich people are making campaigns and saying they are better than the others, but uh, uh, a lottery by chance, people from all over the world. That would be much better. And that they were doing that in Athens. And it's the most successful culture ever in history is the Athenian culture. Half yeah. our civilization comes from there. Fantastic idea. Now something we need to continue to look to. What I'd like to do now is have our commissioner, uh, uh, Dr. Sandra Michael, um, if you have um, any questions for uh, Dr. Cahill or Dr. Nordfor, would you like to ask them, please? Uh, yes, I do have um, some questions as far as uh, Dr. Uh, Cahill. Have you heard about how the study in Italy where they were calling it a bacterium instead of a virus. I mean, that's some of the, and of course it's been inappropriately treated, but they were saying use anti, anticoagulants and, and, um, instead. Yes, I have heard that. So I think there seems to be quite, that was pathologists. And when they actually did mm -hmm. autopsies of some of the patients, they found a lot of clots. And if you listen to Dr. Sherry Tenpenny as well, that she's saying that one of the things that we could do is better look at patients when they come into hospital, if they have metabolic syndrome, if they have diabetes, and if their ferritin levels are high. So it looks like that there are, it is more complex in some of the people who get the worst symptoms. So it, it seems to be that maybe out of uh, you know, 500 people, you know, maybe one to five people, will have severe symptoms. And it could be that you could actually further prevent this by communicating better 
the, that if you have underlying health conditions like high ferritin or metabolic syndrome or diabetes, that you could potentially be on a preventative treatment first. So I think that what we're seeing is now, of course, as well, there are other issues about why would that happen? Why would the ferritin be so high? And why would people react like that? And there could be other environmental factors that maybe are putting stress on the immune system. And I think that's why we will need to have more epidemiological studies to actually look and see if there are environmental factors. Because what I was saying from the very beginning is instead of people, you know, and the media and the politicians just focusing on Wuhan and the Bergamo region in Italy, why didn't they ask and say, well, why do we not have the same kind of deaths in between? So that really what we need to do is to look at those regions and see. So there are other issues as well as, for example, where like in Bergamo, there was 185,000 uh, influenza vaccines given in 2019, which was reported in the newspaper. And so that would have predisposed it. And I think what also we need to stress is it's not elderly people as such. It's people who their immune systems are not boosted. So that I think the potential that comes out of this is good news because what we should be doing through nutrition and vitamins and zinc for future years is to ensure that people's immune systems are boosted no matter if they're 80, 90 or 100 and you could potentially get your vitamin levels measured and your zinc so that then you would be less predisposed. And also since um, coronaviruses are 40% of the viruses that cause influenza-like symptoms, and that we do have, you know, every year people who die, that potentially hydroxychloroquine and zinc could be used as a prophylaxis in other flu years to prevent flu deaths in the wintertime, but also potentially they would be more successful because the influenza vaccine is only shown to work in about one in five people. Whereas if hydroxychloroquine works, this could work potentially for 40% of all future influenzas um, with zinc. And then that the elderly could actually have many years of longer, healthier lives because of what we're now learning from the coronavirus. Yes, that's an excellent point. Um, also, you mentioned vitamins. Of course, vitamin D has also low vitamin D levels have also been... And there. nutrition, of course, as well. And nutrition, so boosting immune function. Sunshine um, also has been proven to, dis to destroy the, um, you know, the the pathogen, whether it's a virus or... <laughs> and that's why there's been like a high number of deaths in some region in Sweden, because they have a lot of African and Somalis, and that they, because of their darker skin, they don't yes. make as much vitamin D from the sunshine. Uh, and so therefore, you know, it, it's really that, that potentially that they have a higher symptom and illness and death rate because of the issue around vitamin D which, you know, vitamin D, there's been Nobel Prizes given for the role of vitamin D and C and 10 vitamins and how they boost the immune system. So partly why I'm speaking out is there's a generation or two generations of doctors who are really misinformed about how the immune system works and how we can actually be healthy through uh, food and nutrition. And I think that's what we need to use this COVID issue to re-educate people and inform ordinary people that they can actually become healthy through food nutrition, reducing stress, um, and proper supplementation if they need it. Yeah, um, excellent point about the black uh, skin because yes, it's a much um, lower absorption and they tend to get a lot less vitamin D, which creates a lot of problems. It's not that the disease is racist, <laughs> but that is a, a, a But skin. it's an important, you know, I think part of the thing, because Dr. Selenko in February and March was actually communicating what the symptoms were. So that potentially if we know this is an issue for future years, if you are living in you know, a Northern hemisphere and you have dark skin, then you would be known to either get more sunlight or to you know, check your vitamin D levels or to eat foods high in vitamin D. So I think we have to you know, learn the lessons, but also promote health and nutrition as well. Absolutely. And, and again, it goes to no data to support this lockdown because people need to be in the sun. The, the sun destroys the viral activity, cannot live in, in the air or on surfaces. And the mass, we need the oxygen. We need the, you know, the CO yeah. and, and they actually create more disease. So I, I thank you for the points you brought up. I think it's very, very important. It's also important how you brought up the overstimulation, overreaction 
of uh, the immune system. It's called a paradoxical response of the immune system. And that's very important to note as far as they're rushing through with no animal studies and um, they're having severe reactions already in the tests um, of, of the vaccines that they've done. And there was a 2012 paper, an excellent paper, yeah, to show that this is issue is around viral interference. It's also unpredictable. Sometimes it can benefit the immune response and sometimes it can be quite negative. And it has been known in RSV vaccines where they put the test vaccine into 35 babies that two of those va babies die. So we've seen this with, deter with um, yellow fever vaccine as well. So there are a number of similar areas where the initial vaccine seems fine in animal models and in humans, but then when they come across the natural virus, they actually have very poor outcomes, so much so that the vaccines would be withdrawn. And what my worry is, is that the solution to this lockdown is to, like the Irish Medicines Organization say, mandatorily vaccinate the total population of Ireland with an influenza vaccine, but they didn't say that it wouldn't be grown on dog tissue and wouldn't have any issue with coronavirus. So I think that's why there is an obligation on us to speak out. Absolutely. Thank you. And yes, Dr. Mikhail, I, I know you mentioned some of that as, as well in that, yes, the most expensive um, vaccine marketing program on, on the planet. Yes. I just want to have two power. As, I wanted to say the same thing about Sweden and, and dark skin and vitamin D. You said it, of course, Dolores, mm -hmm. like always. <laughs> <laughs> but I have another thing I want to, to, to straight, and that's in Madagascar, the president is giving artemisia to everyone. And yeah. I actually prefer, I t that's what I was taking, because I have chronic Lyme. And there's also a treatment as hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. is also a treatment for chronic Lyme. Lyme. But I had artemisia annua, and the combination also with andrographis and the cystus is a very good herb. But artemisia, I think, is equally effective, I would guess, as hydroxychloroquine and has no side effects, basically. And you can even get it without the prescription in some countries. You can, you can buy it, you can make it yourself in your garden. So that's, I really, really would recommend that highly to everyone. And the other thing I wanted to say was, uh, oh, now I forgot it. There was one thing more important. Okay, it was maybe not so important, so I, we can... I think it's important that people know about the Madagascar and how they actually threw the World Health Organization out of the country um, because they were, that it actually came out. Um, he directly uh, expressed how the World Health Organization wanted to pay them a bribe of $20 million to poison the Artemisia or wormwood. It's also known as wormwood, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and they called it an organic. Uh, COVID cure, mm -hmm. which is was highly effective. They had no deaths. They had very high success rate. But one of the things people don't even realize, it's a 98.6% survival rate of this particular, <laughs> of this particular uh, SARS-2 or COVID-19, depending on which you want to call it. Um, so it's a very high survival rate. So these numbers, like you said, there's no data. Where is the data to justify lockdowns and masks and social distancing and to try to push the vaccine? Of course, hydroxychloroquine of, uh, is you know, 99 percent effective, according to a lot of the actual testing. I'm the actual studies in practice with with the people versus doing. Uh, trying to deploy an RNA, an RNA vaccine that has rushed out with no testing with uh, perhaps nanoparticles and retroviruses and, uh, and perhaps a chip or, or, or tracking the trace and track, and which, you know, takes, you know, it, and it seems to be just simply an agenda to push that. I was going to ask where, you know, um, the same thing Thomas Brown asked was about uh, who is who actually banned the use of hydroxychloroquine and zinc in Sweden. Where was that pressure from? Uh, that was from the European Medical Agency. That, uh, they were copying this basically. Uh, so uh, that's, that's 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 where the decision was made. Made, I think. 
Okay, so the, uh, but I, I had I never remember what I wanted to say because I, I said that in the in my videos the same thing as you say we should take hydroxychloroquine, zinc preventively, vitamin D, vitamin C, and then I got a letter from the Swedish health authorities that they want to take my license because I said this, and I think that's important to say in this court case. My my lawyer basically laughed and we didn't really think we should even answer because it's so ridiculous, but they threatened me to take my license because I was speaking up against this because I said it's unethical to say there is no cure because only God can know this you know if you can say something like that you, you, you're, you're posing like you know everything and you can maybe say I don't know a cure but you cannot say there is no cure that is total bullshit and they say that <laughs> everywhere and I think that should be a law that authorities lying in public should be held responsible for this they should, yeah, be, they should be in jail they, they are actually uh, I think if we had been using what I said, we could have had maybe maximum 500 deaths in Sweden. Now we have 4,500. And uh, I also want my next project, I want to make an ITNJ in uh, Scandinavia. And I call it Folkets Ting, the people's thing. That's the thing. That's the old way we were working in the old times in Scandinavia. We were meeting, you know, in a meeting point called the Ting. And then we also like the Athenians, we had court cases and political cases, and we decided together. So I, we have a software now called Liquid Feedback, or Lickback, they call it. And we can use that to, to nail this piece, and we will do that now. We will nail these people, and we'll give them a, a notice that they are under uh, accusement and from the people's thing. And then we can have arguments for and arguments against, and we will use this political system I was talking about, liquid democracy or democracy, to decide uh, in the court. And then we can also together find out the punishment. I mean, that would be very interesting what we yeah, can do. That's mm. very good, because the accountability, and it's good that you brought out also, they've actually made it illegal or criminalized cures. Mm -hmm. I, they will take my license away and they are lying. Big time. They're saying even in the TV4 of Sweden, they were saying you should not take vitamin D. I mean, yeah. I've, I've been working in Sweden taking the test. 95% of all people, white people, have, have a vitamin D deficiency in the winter in Sweden. Yeah, and you also, mentioned the Shanghai, you also mentioned the Shanghai protocol of the high-dose vitamin C IVs, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which is an official government uh, recommendation. And yet mm -hmm. here in the U.S., they also, um, FBI sent in a SWAT team into a clinic to raid it for doing vitamin C IVs. And mm -hmm. also I got a call from, uh, from uh, somebody in Canada, a doctor scientist who they raided and did the same thing for um, silver saw, uh, for mm -hmm. a, a, a nano silver. So I actually mm -hmm. arrested him and I probably, probably will be good to have him give testimony because again, it's the censorship of the doctors and the scientists that I think is um, a very disturbing trend. And where's the accountability for, for the deaths? And I know Dr. Mm -hmm. Dolores, you had another um, something you wanted to add? Yes, just to add, I think that the FDA came out and also said that doctors could not prescribe hydroxychloroquine. And just in the last few days, the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons are taking a court case against the FDA for mm -hmm. them to, it's the first time in history that they have stopped the use of a drug that was licensed by the FDA in uh, 1955 and was the essential medicines in the World Health Organization in 2017, that they've come out and stopped the use. And I would just like to agree with Michael that we will also in Ireland be looking at a tribunal because we need to make the people accountable for who make those decisions to withdraw um, you know, treatment and prevention that will actually save lives. So what we need to do in medical situations to learn for this is who is the person making the decision? Is it in Ireland the Minister for Health? or is it the Irish Medicines Organization, or is it somebody in the European Medicines Agency, or is it that the doctors themselves, you know, because doctors previously, it was a crime. If they, you know, injured someone, it's medical battery um, without full informed consent. So what we need to do is to learn from this and hold individual people to account, because the feeling is that there are probably hundreds of unnecessary deaths because of not telling, you know, the community, the, including 
the radio and the journalists and the politicians, what are the symptoms? How can you prevent it and how can you treat it? But if the medical organizations are not allowing successful treatments um, that have more benefit than harm for being made available to society, then that is very significant because there are unnecessary suffering, illnesses and deaths. And that really will mean that the trust in society between people and the medical profession and their doctors will be broken. So I'm actually surprised in countries like in Ireland, more doctors are not speaking out about this because potentially they could be complicit by not speaking out in preventing a treatment to be made available to people who are vulnerable or old. And we just do not want a society where this can happen. So we, I agree we have to hold um, people to account and actually identify who's making these decisions so that it actually any time a similar situation is done, that someone has to sign and be held liable for making that decision and take accountability and responsibility legally for the consequences of those decisions. Thank you. Right. No, I, I think that that's really where this is going to lead to. Basically, people need to wake up and take control and not just so much trust in the uh, industries that have built up around this. So we've pretty much covered what we can in here. Um, and I know you have another commitment, uh, Dr. Cahill. So I was wondering, um, before I wrap up, do you have any final comments that you'd like to say before we sign off? Well, for me, I'm very happy to be involved and I think I'm very happy to be in this kind of forum because what the way the situation is now, each individual people and small country think that they are alone in fighting this. And the more that we can have international organizations and learn from each other and have different scientists and doctors and, uh, you know, people with legal backgrounds helping each other in this fight, I think actually we can have a new era of health. You know, that actually we can use the situation of the coronavirus, the issues that we know are in the medical journals and in the medical profession and in the regulatory agencies that are preventing, you know, cheap and effective treatments from reaching people um, and threatening, you know, doctors with being struck off after spending decades educating themselves that this is not the kind of world we want and that we have to have judicial platforms to hold people to account and potentially build new media platforms to educate you know, people so that they can be more informed about how they can stay healthy um, and take charge of their own health and hold people to account. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, thank you, that's, that's very, very brilliant. Uh, Dr. Nordfors, any final comments you'd like to bring up? Well, uh, I, I once made uh, some months ago a little exercise about you know, what I should do in the future. And I got uh, what you call it, a judge club, you know, what the boom, you say. That was my, uh, my, my t tool. And I think that's what I will go for now. I will make, this, make them accountable. And now it is totally, totally visible. They are lying to us with this Lancet study. I think this will be the turning point. I think this might, might be the most, the study most, uh, you know, with the most significance in the last hundred years, and it was fake. Because they are desperate now. The people, these, these, these bastards are desperate and they do anything now to, to survive. And they know they cannot survive if the hydroxychloroquine succeeds because then, then everybody knows they've been lying all the time and they will be held accountable and we will have to do everything to do that now. And they will try to silence it down. And we have to tell every news newspaper, they were putting it out great, the big time on the first page that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work like holding a study, et cetera, et cetera. Now they have to make the denial and they have to make it with the same size as the first thing. Otherwise we will have the newspapers accountable too because they are, they are giving out false, very important information to the people. So we have to be tough now and to really follow through and then we will win because we have a golden opportunity right now to do this. I agree, thank you very much. And thanks so much to uh, both of you for that. So basically, I'd just like to uh, you know, thank you, Dr. Dolores Cahill, uh, Dr. Mikhail Nordfors, and um, our commissioner, uh, Dr. Sandra Michael, um, trustee Reverend Dr. Nancy Ash, and uh, Imani Mamalushin and Chris Fern for sitting in. So I'd like to turn this over to our bench, uh, 
uh, Chief Justice Sir John Walsh and uh, Justice Una McGurk for final comments and closing the session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, Dr. Nordfors said something interesting a number of times. He said they are lying, and that is quite obvious. I'm in Australia at the present time, and there is an international uh, or national news broadcast a couple of weeks ago about the youngest victim of the coronavirus has just died, a 30-year-old healthy male person. And he was from a small town. The entire town uh, went out and had a public memorial for him. And it was national television. This is a tragedy. Two weeks, uh, that was two weeks ago. This week, an independent pathologist examined the body before it was buried. And lo and behold, he did not have the coronavirus. He died from something completely unrelated to it. And basically what they're doing in Australia is anyone who dies, uh, even if it's a suicide, they attribute it to the coronavirus. The suicides, of course, suicided because they had the coronavirus. That's the, that's the theory. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's re really quite, quite pathetic. But uh, uh, what uh, Professor Carl said about the lockdown being unnecessary, it is unnecessary. And uh, in fact, uh, since they've had the lockdown in Australia, alcohol consumption has gone up considerably. Domestic violence has doubled and they've had to put on extra police to counter the alcoholism and the domestic violence, which wasn't there when life was normal and people went to work and came home and life went on. Now, is Una still connected? Yeah, if she is, I'd like to ask if she has any final questions or comments that she'd like to make. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. If I may, I would just like to ask Professor Cahill one uh, final question, which is with regard to the Irish situation, Professor Cahill. Do you know what the attitude of the Irish Medicines Board is with regard to the prescribing of hydroxychloroquine and any directions that they have given to Irish GPs and doctors with regard to this matter? So I do know that I did get um, a correspondence from the manufacturer of hydroxychloroquine in Ireland about uh, two and a half, so it would have been the middle of May or so, where they were more or less informing doctors that there was no clinical trial associated with hydroxychloroquine and for them to take that into account. But of course, in a pandemic situation where we don't have time to do a clinical trial, doctors are ethically and morally and legally required to use their judgment. And in March, uh, around 25th of March, there was a study from Soromo in doctors in 30 countries, 20,000 doctors, and they found hydroxychloroquine and zinc to be the most effective treatment. This was published on the 2nd of April, 2020. So the guidance from the manufacturer in Ireland came out in May, 2020. So I consider that that is an inappropriate guidance considering in a pandemic situation with the new virus, you wouldn't have time to have a clinical trial necessarily. And that if globally doctors are finding it uh, one of the most beneficial treatments with zinc and to measure the QT interval of the heart, I find that that guidance was unhelpful. And uh, do you believe that Irish people have suffered as a consequence? Well, I think that is the issue, I think, that we need to. So there is a very brave doctor here, Dr. Marcus de Bruyne, has come out. And I suppose what he also was highlighting is that the care homes, there wasn't enough oxygen for the elderly people. And also there was some guidance that they may not be brought to hospital from the care homes if they were unwell. And he was saying that they didn't replace the full oxygen cylinders if a patient an elderly patient was on oxygen, that the oxygen cylinder was taken away and only returned hours or a day later, and that person may have died. So he is saying that there could have been preventable deaths if that wasn't you know, on it. So what I would say is that those patients would not have been breathless, you know, those elderly people, if they had been given the nutrition and the vitamins and the preventative dose treatments. 
So I think we need to look in the care homes. It could be that the owners of the care homes were not given the information or the doctors weren't given the information. And that's why I think we have to come back to the censorship online and how like in Ireland, the, the national radio and TV are not having people, you know, doctors and scientists on the debates to inform society, you know, because if people knew, they would be asking their doctors and their health professionals for preventative treatments. So it is a kind of a convoluted that if they're censoring the information, the general public don't know to ask, and then there are unnecessary deaths. So I think that's partly why we need to look into this in an inquiry situation globally and in countries like Ireland, and to learn the lessons to try and reduce the impact of this happening again. Thank you very much, Professor Cahill. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it's incumbent upon me now to formally declare uh, session number seven uh, of these hearings from the Judicial Commission uh, formally at a close. I'd like to thank everybody for the participation. Uh, uh, thank you, Thomas, for your chairmanship. Uh, and moderation uh, in the absence of, so we got so used to, to Sasha doing it that I'd like to th thank Professor Carl and Dr. Norfors for uh, attending and, and uh, giving their, their evidence uh, and uh, Amani for hosting and recording uh, the, the, these proceedings. So I wish everyone uh, well uh, to have uh, a pleasant uh, morning, afternoon, evening, or whatever, depending on what your uh, time zone uh, uh, is. Uh, and uh, uh, as my uh, uh, Irish aunt used to say whenever I visited and, and uh, went back home to England, she'd say, if anything happens to you on the way back home, I hope you get to heaven half an hour before the devil knows that you're gone. So... I don't know if that still works or not, but I appreciate the participation of everybody and I look forward, Thomas, to your white paper uh, when we finish these proceedings and seeing you uh, all again uh, probably at the uh, summit uh, at the end of June.